So um, thank you everyone for joining today and thank you especially to Devin Walsh for, um, for presenting today. Um, just a real quick, um, if I may just read off your speaker bio. Um, we know that you're class of 2011 in economics at Princeton and you also um, received an MBA from MIT in entrepreneurial strategy. And so you're the founder of Reverb Network and um, that has the goal of democratizing access to knowledge, networks and capital required for entrepreneurs to found successful businesses anywhere. So Devin is gonna talk today about um, underlying causes of the mismatch and where capital is actually invested. Um, she mentioned um, in uh, the information she sent us about the webinar that only three states, California, New York, and Massachusetts um, were invested uh, in, um, you know, startups invested in, during, uh, in, in that area. And why is that? And what can we do to um, increase the visibility of startups and networks across the uh, nation. Um, and one major place that she's hoping to do that is the Jersey Shore, which um, I am very fond of being a New Jersey native myself. Um, so I'm really excited to hear what she's gonna talk about today. Thanks so much, Devin. Great, thanks, Stephanie. Um, I'll share my screen now, if that works. Can you, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Great. Okay, cool. So, so I'll just uh, kick things off. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you so much for joining today. Um, I've had the pleasure of getting to spend more time with the Princeton entrepreneurial ecosystem recently in the past few months, um, getting to know Stephanie and folks at the Keller Center, um, as well as I recently signed on as a venture advisor to Chack Ventures, which if you weren't already aware of, is a venture fund that invests in early stage tech companies that are founded by Princeton alumni. So it's been really fun and an absolutely delight to get to know more, more folks in the community. And I'm very excited that um, the Princeton entrepreneurial scene is, is alive and well and, and growing um, in, in a great way. So uh, today I wanted to um, take some time to talk through uh, the time I've spent recently contributing to the startup ecosystem at the Jersey Shore uh, in New Jersey, which I'm sure many of you know in one way or another are either there now or um, have, have been there when uh, things uh, weren't quite so remote. Um, and I'm going to talk about why I think building startup communities is important. Um, some of the ideas and motivations for why I am doing this uh, and my approach. Um, I also think that there's an opportunity for students who, uh, for, for anyone kind of watching who's a student interested in entrepreneurship to get involved in the startup ecosystem in your hometown or wherever you may be spending time. So I'll kind of talk about why that could be a cool opportunity uh, now. So a lot of my work has been motiva motivated by various biases that um, have been well-researched in which I have seen play out firsthand in high-tech startup ecosystems, uh, where the majority of venture capitalists and startup founders are white and men, um, uh, and where the majority of activity is centered in a few cities along the coasts. Um, so if you look at some of the statistics, they're, they're pretty damning. Um, all female founding teams receive one and a half to two and a half percent of VC dollars. People of color are wildly underrepresented in terms of the VC capital that they're receiving. One or two, one to two percent um, of VC dollars going to Black and Latinx founders. Geographically, as Stephanie mentioned, um, twenty percent of the U.S. population is in these three states: California, New York, Massachusetts. But these states, more recently, are receiving eighty to eighty-five percent of VC dollars. And if we look at these statistics during COVID, so from March through now specifically do it during um, the third quarter, you see that VC investments on a macro level have not been as negatively impacted as maybe we would have predicted initially. So 
in the third quarter, there were about $38 billion worth of, of deals done. However, the biases in the deployment of this capital were more pronounced. So you saw less capital proportionally going to people of color, women, um, some evidence that more of this capital is being deployed on the coasts in those hubs, SF, New York, et cetera. And you see this, this stat that um, shows in 2020, um, uh, all female founding teams are receiving much less proportionally than they have in the past. So some of the efforts that have been made to diversify the allocation of capital um, may be um, kind of falling apart as VCs are, are struggling to figure out the remote work culture, maybe going more closely in on, on their networks, um, which may be less diverse. So why do we care? Um, I, I don't know that I have to dig into this too much, but I truly believe, and there's research to show that diverse founders and founders from underrepresented communities can deliver value to these markets with under and um, undermet and unmet needs better than maybe the more traditional um, homogenous uh, startup founding and, and VC communities. Um, I also truly believe you can't be what you can't see. So building out diverse waves of founders in new locations now may help make it easier for the next wave of founders um, to see themselves in those positions um, and start the wheels turning on maybe founding their own business earlier on than, than maybe they would otherwise. From a geographic perspective, now I mentioned race and, and, um, and gender as, as kind of biases as well. I'm really focusing on uh, geographic allocation of, of capital. So why does this, why does this specifically matter? Why do we care about this? Well, VC investment um, continues to grow massively. Um, so you can see this graph kind of show it's it's exploded like over the past 10 years, I don't know, more than like 3x or so. Um, in, in this is billions of dollars that are going to high paying jobs for highly educated professionals in a given region. And not only is it going to, to developers, to product managers, to all of these like high paying jobs that have the pot potential to, to pay dividends for whoever is employed in these positions, there's also a massive multiplier effect. So you're deploying this money into a, a startup, a high growth startup, and it not only goes to those professionals, but it goes to the, the lawyers, design shops, consultants, construction, et cetera, all of these kind of second order impacts that um, are uh, positive multipliers for the, the wealth of the surrounding area. Third, um, I just fundamentally believe a lot of people do that you should be able to found a business with a shot at success wherever you choose to live. Um, and, you know, lastly, um, if you look at new business creation in the US, and, and this includes high growth venture backed businesses, as well as uh, SME, kind of small lifestyle businesses as well. So, so kind of both of those groups. Um, new business creation is at an all-time low or low uh, over the past few several decades, which may be a surprising statistic to, to see when you think about the amount of, of press that startups have, have gotten in the past few years. But nevertheless, um, that there, there is definitely kind of a hairy issue here in, in solving how do we get more businesses um, founded outside of the coasts and outside of those those hubs. Um, so how does this happen? You know, there, there are statistics and research that say that, you know, innovation and entrepreneurship does tend to thrive in areas with increased density, diversity, and scale. And you tend to get that, of course, in, in large cities. Um, there are also um, this trend agglomeration effects. So basically what this says is that in particularly dense areas, um, you have a lot of benefit um, from co-locating housing and output in a particular area. Um, in other words, what this means is the transaction costs of a business matching up with the right talent, infrastructure providers, third-party services, 
inputs to a supply chain for a hardware business, if all of those are located more closely to you, it's, it's easier to find, takes less time, takes fewer resources, um, and allows you to move on to the next thing, potentially succeed faster and easier than you would otherwise. Um, and then thirdly, and I'll talk a bit more about this, uh, for it is possible for um, smaller scale uh, startup communities to, to thrive in suburban or rural areas um, with a collaborative mindset between stakeholders. So while there is this tendency for innovation and entrepreneurship to thrive in, in more urban environments in bigger cities, um, there has been a lot of study and a lot written about um, in terms of startup communities. And these are um, complex collaborative systems of entrepreneurship on a, a local level that can be truly anywhere. Um, and the person who's written most about this is Brad Feld. He's the founder of Techstars. Um, he wrote his first book about this phenomenon in 2012 um, after building up the startup community in, in Boulder for several years. Uh, he recently published this new book. Uh, I highly recommend it to anyone who's interested in this, in this topic. And basically what, what he says is he, he talks about um, how to build up a community of, of startups and entrepreneurship and collaboration in a non-urban environment. And as an example, he uses Boulder, which is where he has lived for the past decade. And Boulder is fascinating because it um, is not only, I mean, gorgeous, beautiful, um, a lot of like great hiking um, and outdoor kind of things to do there. But it at a population of around 100,000, which is um, minuscule compared to some of the, the cities like, like New York and San Francisco, et cetera, um, has the fourth highest dollar amount of venture capital invested per capita in the world. And this is ahead of Beijing, New York, and Berlin, some other kind of prominent startup hubs. So there is a lot of startup activity, a lot of entrepreneurship happening in this relatively small city. And what Brad and some of his collaborators, others who have written about this phenomenon have um, pointed out is that, you know, Boulder as a city has um, a well-educated workforce, leading research universities, high-tech companies and research labs, um, amenities and strong sense of community, what really, a lot of cities, a lot of places have those things. What has allowed Boulder to stand out as a true startup community, a hub of venture capital and, and um, startups is the critical mass of people who are collaborative and helpful. Um, a give first mentality, um, a highly collaborative culture with many touch points between all of the stakeholders involved in the startup community. So this is entrepreneurs who are leading the initiatives and who are the ones who are at kind of the center of all of the activities, but also universities, government, investors, um, other supporters, et cetera. Um, and he talks through a few core principles for how to take you know, what has been done at Boulder and apply it to your local community, wherever that may be, which may be, you know, Princeton or another university, by the way. Um, he says, you know, entrepreneurs must lead the movement. There must be a long-term commitment between, you know, 10 to 20 years, uh, must be inclusive, and it must have continual activities that engage the entire entrepreneurial stack all with this kind of over, overriding theme of connectivity, collaboration, and give first. And again, the, the idea here is the collaboration helps um, entrepreneurs get the most out of the resources that, that are available. There may be fewer resources available in some than are available in SF or, or New York, one of those hubs, but the collaborative component ensures that the entrepreneur gets the most out of those resources is more likely to succeed, um, to grow, grow their wealth, bring in more talent, and kind of create that virtuous cycle of drawing in more entrepreneurs into the area. And so how do you do this kind of logistically? So there are a few great examples um, through the book. And you know, a lot of these may 
may not be um, so not obvious, but but there's uh, grant programs, having formal spaces for entrepreneurs that are open 24 seven, formal or informal mentorship programs, pitch competitions, meetup groups, hacking weekends. And then there are kind of maybe the, the less expected and informal things that entrepreneurs can, can do um, that are, are less organized. So Brad and a few other um, uh, founders and kind of contributors to the community um, will set aside one day per month where they set up 15 minute meetings with any new entrepreneur who's who's in the area, someone who's visiting Boulder who may want to learn more about um, about the area and the community. And those 15 minutes are spent connecting and then figuring out how to connect that person to the next set of people in the community who could help them. Um, another tip they give is having 10 to 15 people, entrepreneurs in, in the community, um, stakeholders on standby who have opted in to um, any introductions that might come their way. So when someone new enters the community, you can kind of auto send out an intro and get that person on their way to meeting as many people as possible, learning about what's available, finding potential collaborators, et cetera. So now, shifting gears a bit, going down to, to my, my story specifically. Um, so I have spent the past two years as a uh, VC investor in the city. In April, I um, took, took a leap um, and well, at the time I didn't know it was a leap, but I uh, decided to take some time outside of New York, which was shut down and very dreary and claustrophobic and go to a place that my family has in Avon, New Jersey, which is a small beach town um, right on the beach. And with all of the kind of spare time you had during, during those, those early months in shutdown, I began to look around and realize, you know, that the Jersey shore had evolved significantly from when I was a kid, uh, specifically the tech scene, um, the entrepreneurship scene had evolved significantly. Um, and I wanted to learn more about what was going on in, in New Jersey from a, a VC perspective. Um, and, you know, it's, it's funny, there's the mismatch between talent and capital really began to um, become much more clear to me as I looked into stats at, in New Jersey, which is my, my home state that I know, know well. Um, in 2018, New Jersey only received 1% of, um, only had, headquartered within it, I guess, 1% of, of companies that, that did a VC deal and only half a percent of VC dollars were invested in to New Jersey. And I think um, all the folks on the call should be at least somewhat aware of New Jersey and all of the talent that's, that's in the state, you know, at Princeton alone, that's a somewhat shocking statistic. I think I, I probably don't need to go through some of the highlights of, of what's in New Jersey, but I basically looked around and saw a really interesting foundational setup and you know a lot of interesting activity already happening to build up innovation in the state. You've got obviously Princeton, Rutgers, NJIT, fantastic universities, fantastic public school system, one of the top in the country. You've got Newark Venture Partners, which is um, sponsored by Audible, which is based in Newark, um, the podcast company. Um, fantastic kind of accelerator program for B2B companies, less than a 1% um, acceptance rate. And they have worked together with Newark to really turn Newark into a, a startup hub um, in its own right. You've got Tech United, which is community for entrepreneurs and stakeholders, Propelify, which is an, an annual event, um, which this year was, was virtual, fantastic, lasted a week. You had Andrew Yang um, and a ton of other fantastic entrepreneurs and, and speakers through the program. Um, the Economic Development Authority has put in place a ton of programs, including an angel investment tax credit, um, matching investments with VC investments going into the state, um, co-working subsidies and other subsidies for startups in the state. And then you've got Governor Murphy, who is really pushing to up entrepreneurship in the state. Um, though I think it's, it's stalled in the state legislature, um, he had suggested and written legislation for an innovation 
evergreen fund that would raise money from, um, I guess, issue debt, I think, to, to raise money to invest alongside VCs in homegrown startups, um, which is pretty uh, exciting if it, if it goes through. I think about more specifically the Jersey Shore. And on the map, I kind of highlighted to show, you can kind of see Princeton to the left, I kind of cut it off, but it's about maybe an hour and a half away. And then you go up to New York, you can see how far away that is. You kind of get, um, I don't know, there, I think there are a lot of fantastic features of the shore that have been underused by the New York, uh, I guess, startup ecosystem. Um, I think for one, um, culturally, it's just fantastic and a lot of fun. I, I look at some place like Asbury Park um, and there are New York quality bars and restaurants, but a lot more space and, and a little bit um, cheaper. Um, you've got fantastic live music scene. This is where Bruce Springsteen and Bon Jovi came up. So you've got big concert venues kind of in the, in the middle of town, which are center points, um, great craft brewery scene, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Asbury Park was also named uh, the third best beach city for entrepreneurs by one of those entrepreneurship magazines recently. Um, in addition to that though, you have a lot of other um, kind of more uh, logistical um, uh, benefits of, of being here. Um, there is a one hour ferry from Red Bank to Financial District and they're building another ferry that will be about an hour um, kind of door to door as well a bit further south, um, which is very exciting. Um, you've got co-working spaces up and down the shore. You've got a variety of meetups, including Jersey Shore Tech and a few offshoots of that. Um, economic opportunity zones all through Long Branch, Asbury Park, and Neptune. Um, just a, a variety of, when I was kind of doing my research into the area, I saw a variety of really exciting components of what I think could be a very um, uh, high energy, high impact entrepreneurial ecosystem. For those of you who are familiar with, with LA and Los Angeles and how it's, how it's laid out, um, there's a ton of tech happening right on the beach in Santa Monica, Venice, et cetera. And I kind of see the Jersey Shore as potentially serving that uh, beach outpost of, of the kind of inner downtown city um, branch of, of New York and New York's tech ecosystem. Um, now, what, what exactly am I doing? So, um, so as of over the summer, um, I, I started doing work and, and formally quit my job in September. And all of the work that I've done thus far is to um, take those lessons from, from Boulder and Brad Feld and startup communities and do what I could to bring in and include all stakeholders in the entrepreneurial ecosystem. Um, connect them with with one another, help them to collaborate, and um, yeah, just kind of go go from there. Um, just helping to really build up that collaboration and connectivity within within the community because it had been a bit desperate. There were folks who were kind of just working on building their own business, but they had their head down. There wasn't that connectivity element. So the first thing I did is is found this meetup, Jersey Shore Startup Meetup. Um, started this in August, September, and this has been a lot of fun. Uh, almost 100 members have joined thus far. We've had four meetups so far, all virtual. Um, and this has served a few purposes. So for me at first, it was one way for me to begin to meet um, some of the stakeholders and entrepreneurs in the area. Um, Two, I think it's a it's been a great way to shine a spotlight on some of the work being done by founders in the area. So you see two of the sessions which we had by um, two two businesses, Simply Flows, which is um, founded by a, a woman um, who's who uh, just graduated, got her executive MBA from Temple, um, small business process automation tool. You've got Rapid Dream, which allows you to spin up development environments very easily. Uh, focused on improving the developer experience. So had those two sessions really helped them practice their, their pitching skills um, in front of an audience. Um, there have been 
great stories told to me of entrepreneurs connecting after the meetups to talk through, to give each other advice, to have follow-up conversations, which is great. Um, you don't always expect that in a, after a virtual meetup. Um, and third, you know, it's a great way, I think, to, for, to shine a spotlight on some of these entrepreneurs who may not be used to getting, um, to, to getting attention or being able to kind of show off what, what they've built. Um, so second, um, the other thing that I've been working on is, again, um, in order to further focus on increasing collaboration between, between stakeholders, I'm putting together a, a lightweight um, tech accelerator program. So the idea here is to focus on not just bringing entrepreneurs together and connecting them one another, but truly bringing in um, a set of mentors from the community. So uh, what I've done is bring in local lawyers who have a focus on, on startups and entrepreneurs, um, designers to help with some front end UI work, which may be really difficult to do in house, especially early on. Um, this guy, Jim Scott, who offers financial services and accounting as a service, he's a CFO as a service is his, his business. Um, and then uh, local or executives who are from the area have gone on to do fantastic things like um, uh, you've got Jim Schofield, who's a uh, chief information officer at Marriott, did the same job at, at Nike, has super well established and successful, is from the area and wants it to succeed, so has signed on to, to advise some of the, the uh, founders in the program. Um, and yeah, so the idea is we'll get together once a week, have a guided discussion on a particular topic, and you see some of the the topics to the left. This is taken from um, a course that I was a teacher's assistant for at MIT, um, very much in, inspired by, by a lot of the coursework there. We'll have a guided discussion on you know market segmentation, go to market, all of that good stuff. And then also have um, a focus program where uh, the entrepreneurs and founders can connect with, with all of these mentors who have signed on to support and connect with them. Um, now that's, that's kind of what, what I'm doing, but I also think that it's important to highlight the bigger opportunity here. I think, um, we kind of took a step back and looked at the larger VC scene, zeroed in on what I'm doing in New Jersey, the opportunity here. I think taking another step back and looking at kind of what's going on right now. Um, and I think you see geographically, you know, a lot of population moving around, spending time and settling down in places they may not have otherwise. So if you look at New York and SF, um, you have data from Redfin and Street Easy kind of showing that there is net migration out of those cities that's much larger than has been in, in previous years. A lot of millennials probably around my age, um, maybe in their late 20s, early 30s, who may be speeding up a move to the suburbs, rural areas, um, what may have been a few years down the line, they're, they're taking that, that step now. You have a rise in um, kind of this trend of digital nomads. So folks who, um, as they're like, who will work, but are always working remotely, um, that's gone up a, a few percentage points over the past few years. Um, and then you've got Facebook, Microsoft, Twitter, Square, all of these tech companies have now embedded it into their policies that, you know, moving forward, virus or no virus, we will have a work from home remote culture that will not only allow folks who maybe had previously lived in the hub to move outside of that hub, but will also open up um, the talent pool much wider. So someone who's in Omaha, Nebraska, who's a really talented coder, but maybe needs to stay near um, near home to take care of their, their parents. Maybe it's a, a mother who's taking care of their, their kids, wants to stay near family. It opens up that talent pool so that person can maybe get trained at a Facebook or a Twitter. Just opens up the um, amount of folks who can get that high quality tech expertise and build out their, their networks. Um, third, you're also seeing these high propensity business applications. Um, so these are businesses which are um, based on 
I guess like census data, I think, um, highly likely to be high growth and hire multiple people. You've seen a massive jump over the past few months of, of these businesses being founded. And this includes venture backable as well as small like SME type businesses. So you see this massive population redistribution. You see um, the ability for folks in rural suburban areas, um, potentially over time being able to, to get jobs at these Facebooks, et cetera, and, and grow their knowledge, grow their networks. Um, and you see many new businesses being, being founded. Um, I think there's a massive kind of opportunity to build these startup communities um, using this new tech talent, using um, kind of all these folks who may be out of a job or wanting to, to switch gears and found something new, there's an ability to found a lot of these startup communities throughout the US. And, you know, circling back to some of the biases that I brought up earlier in the presentation, if you look at the, the distribution of um, kind of Black Americans, Latinx Americans, if you, there's a massive concentration of, you know, Black Americans in uh, Florida, North Carolina, Texas, et cetera, with more startup communities, which are geographically distributed, it's possible to potentially, if they're built in an open and inclusive way, um, begin to work on correcting those misalignments as well. Um, so yeah, I think that is kind of it from me. Um, I don't know how we're doing on, time but oh I think the last thing I want to say is um, if you think what I've spoken about today is interesting um, I'm looking for an intern to help me build out the programming for the accelerator program so you really get to um, I guess leverage a lot of your coursework that you're probably using but also get to dig into like YC startup school type material a lot of stuff that I think is really fascinating and put it together in a really lightweight, easy to digest way for a lot of these entrepreneurs. And then two, I think, um, you know, there's potentially an opportunity for students who may be working, um, studying remotely. Um, if you're, you know, bored, have some spare time, maybe get to know the entrepreneurs in your hometown um, and see how, how you can potentially use your skills to, to build out uh, these networks uh, locally. And that's it for me. Great, thanks, Devin. Let me rejoin so that um, people can see me talking. But um, thank you so much. I, you know, I feel like there is such an opportunity here. Um, first of all, I know that there are a lot of um, New Jersey uh, natives that um, are at Princeton. Um, over the years of working at Princeton, I've met so many of them, and so um, and and what is stressful to me is seeing people come into the state and do wonderful things and then leave. So um, maybe, you know, maybe there's something about New Jersey that can hold, hold students here even after they graduate. Um, I mean, especially if they are a New Jersey native. And I think your idea of starting something at the Jersey Shore is just super amazing because it, it's, I mean, who doesn't love the beach? Um, and you, you have, you're in close proximity to New York, Philly, to Princeton, to you know all these tech corridors. So, um, I wish you a lot of luck with it. Um, I definitely will. Um, you know, we'll make sure that we stay in touch, so we can hopefully feed you students to um, to get get your your accelerator going at the shore. Um, do you have any idea when you would start that the accelerator program and what um, it would look like or so yeah, so I think um, I've been talking to a few folks and I think I'll probably end up doing something um, like some open source type um, meetups with more structured programming starting in January, February. I have a lot of mentors signed up. So I definitely want to start putting their, their um, time to, to use and, and connecting them with folks. So yeah, I think we'll probably start, I'll probably start doing something in, in January, February. Great. Um, okay, so I see that we've got a question here. Um, do you get the sense that COVID has changed the cultural dynamic in the greater New York City area in a way that has encouraged the collaborative mentality needed for startup community success, uh, a mentality that isn't typically associated with this region? 
So has COVID changed the dynamic? Yeah, that's that's a good question. Um, I actually do in that I think, um, so I've been joining a lot of New Jersey focused um, kind of virtual meetups. And I think, you know, the, what New Jersey maybe didn't have going for it is the fact that there, there are a lot of kind of smaller hubs, whereas with New York, you have everything kind of together in the, the island of Manhattan. Here, you've got things a bit more spread out. Um, with COVID, total sh shift to virtual for not only kind of meetups, but also big programs like Propelify, Princeton Engage, I think had a great audience. I attended that. And I think it, it one, expands the number of people who can join and potentially partake in a lot of these conferences. And two, I think it, I have noticed a shift in just like a lot of, I've met a lot of people through these conferences, funnily enough, like maybe as many as I would if I were to go to them in person. Um, because I think people are, are kind of like sitting at home and maybe kind of like bored going like stir crazy are more likely willing and able to reach out to someone via via the conference kind of meetup features um, to chat with them after. Um, I think people are also recognize that a lot of small businesses may be struggling and uh, really do want to give back and use their resources, time, expertise, networks to help um, small businesses. I've had so many people come reach out to me, um, almost too many people reach out to me because they want to mentor and, and give back. And, you know, I don't know how much COVID plays into that, but, but I don't think it doesn't <laughs> impact that. Yeah. You know, it's funny. I've actually, um, I've seen a lot of mention lately. Um, well, you know, since COVID um, about helping out the mom and pop shop, helping out small businesses and don't go and buy a ton of things from Amazon because you know they've got plenty of money, but why not invest your dollars um, and care more about um, you know the, the small businesses? And I think that New Jersey definitely needs that. And I think that having like some sort of entrepreneurial programming around that could help you know devise ways to to build up um, the economy here and build up the networks so that we can be more self-sustaining and not have to rely on like these gigantic, I mean, I, I have to admit, I do order from Amazon, you know, I'm <laughs> you know and say like, go to. buy from them. Yeah. But um, I definitely feel that, um, especially in New Jersey, uh, we, we have the power to um, build ourselves up and create a, a really exciting state if only people would stick around. But I think they have. Um, a lot of people I've talked to have moved out of the city. Um, I knew someone who lived in Manhattan for like 20 years and he left, he went out to the West Coast. So um, there are people that are leaving. So maybe they'll end up in New Jersey. I hope, you know, we're not, we're not, you know, we're not yeah. just Newark airport. <laughs> There's a lot more to us. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think my brother just moved to um, Jersey City and for like half the price of, of what you could get in New York. He has like a proper two bedroom in a building yeah. with a, a roof deck and everything. So, um, and, and yeah, he's, he's pretty pleased with that. So um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot of interesting stuff going on. And I think, uh, you know, with, with New York and the state it's in, I love New York. I think New York will come back, but um, I think it, it may shift kind of the, the internal math the, that one does in their head about kind of where, where they're going to live, especially mm -hmm. if they're making a big capital investment to start a start Right, a exactly. Okay, so um, I think we've answered all the questions. If anyone else has anything um, or if they want to connect with Devin um, after this, let us know. Um, we've got everyone's email address. We can share, um, you know, share information with you or get you connected separately. And we're definitely going to be looking out for um, you know, Reverb Networks Accelerator. Um, and we would love to hear what, what you've got going on you know, as soon as that gets, gets uh, launched. So awesome. thank you so much for being here. Thank um, you, thank you for having me. I really appreciate sure. it. Um, anyone else has any last questions or we're going to sign off. So, oh, let's see, what do we have here? Oh, okay. Um, one more question is, well, says, hi, Devin, thanks for the presentation. Do you think that the switch to digital due to COVID makes physical spaces less or more important? 
Yeah, that, that's an interesting, it's an interesting question. Um, I think how physical spaces are leveraged will change. I think most folks would agree that it's possible to do business re remotely, virtually, but that there are, you know, <laughs> business, but also kind of mental benefits to just working in the same place as, as someone. Um, and I think I've actually, I've spoken to a co-working space, which is starting up and, and they're actually launching one in New Jersey. I mean, in a, in Princeton, I can connect with you on, on them. I think they're called the drop-in and oh. they're very cool. So they're building a kind of a new kind of co-working space where mm -hmm individuals can book, they don't need to book on a monthly basis. They can book on a day-to-day -day kind of hour to hour right. basis. So they're basically building a, a co-working space, not for kind of full-time work, but for the person who's maybe working remotely and who needs, um, who needs to take a meeting and wants kind of a, a nicer space, who yeah. maybe wants to spend a few days, maybe if, if their collaborator is visiting for a few days, they want to work together in, in a small office space, they can book it for, for a few days. Um, so, and I thought, I thought that was, that was pretty interesting because I think that I like, I would definitely not say that everything should, I don't think anyone wants everything to go to virtual. I think just mentally and emotionally, psychologically being near other people, there's a massive benefit to that if, it, if it's safe. Um, but, you know, I think in the short term, we'll see physical spaces with a lot more flexibility built in, built for the person who maybe is working from home 90% of the time, but still wants a space for, for some niche use, use cases. So I'm, I'm predicting that's probably what, what may happen. Absolutely. I think flexibility is key. Um, and yeah, we have over, gosh, I don't even know how many months it's been now, but you know, most of us at Princeton have been home since March 13th, basically. Yeah. And um, we have, we've, we've seen how much we can accomplish um, virtually, but of course there is that human element that we're missing. So I think sort of like having a flexible schedule um, works for so many people. I mean, I've heard from so many people that it's great to be able to do things from home and take care of what you need, but then also jump on a call and put in um, your time at work um, and, and get it all done um, and be wearing pajama pants at the same yeah. time. <laughs> I'm not though, I swear. Um, okay. But yeah, no, I think that's, um, I think it's really, it's really great to see that people are, be, are able to achieve as much as they are um, in a virtual setting. So yeah. like we are now. Yeah. So, um, well, Devin, thank you so much again for, for being here today. And, um, we'll definitely be keeping in touch with you and seeing what happens on your journey. And, um, thank everyone else for joining us. And if you want to reach out, you want to get connected to Devin, let me know and I will help you out. Thanks so, everyone for joining. Really appreciate it. And th thank you to Stephanie and the Keller, Keller Center as well. Great. Have a great day. Have a great weekend, everyone. Great. Take Bye. care. Bye.